And that was a moment in our service where we, we do our, our best to practice, to ground ourselves, practice to find a center in ourselves, find a center in our community. We do so with word and with silence and with some music. And as we enter this moment, I um, invite you to do whatever helps you feel comfortable in your seat. Um, if that is with your feet on the floor, with your head bowed, your eyes closed, hands clasped even, so whatever feels comfortable for you in this moment. Oh, spirit of love and life, that creative energy that flows through us in so many ways, flows around us in so many ways, that helps us feel held and comforted and, and together. We, we are grateful for all the good things in our lives, big and small, from new, new job opportunities that will have a huge impact on our community to the ability to come and just sit with friends. We're grateful for, for the wonderful food and drink that we enjoy this time of year and all year round. The, the food that not only tastes great and nourishes us, but also in a way is the best way for us to to connect with each other, to remember the rituals that we have, the, the, the meals that, that are extra special for us. And even as we are grateful, there are, there are many things in our personal lives and in this world that, that deserve our attention, perhaps even our wonder, our curiosity, Things that pop up in our health that if we weren't curious about, it may go unresolved. Things that pop up in our relationships that if we're not curious about, may turn into something that is untenable. And things in this world that without our curiosity, without our wonder, without our generous attention. There may be a path towards something that is the opposite of beloved community. The, perhaps even something headed toward hell on earth. And I don't think that that is ever going to happen because we gather here once again, over again. We gather with our friends and family community is nourished and held and blooms in the space in our hearts and the space between each of us. May we remember that with awe and a reverence for the awe of life as we move into this moment of silence.
blessed be an amen. Shifting from defensiveness to curiosity by Reverend Tandy Rep. Rogers, a U.S. religious educator extraordinaire, spiritual, spiritual director and facilitate faculty at Mead, the Lombard, and an absolutely splendid person. I have a middle school son who is very into Dungeons and Dragons. Last Saturday, he invited me into this world. We created a character. I'm a wood elf named Lulu. When he asked me what I wanted my superpower to be, I told him that I wanted the sound of my laughter to cause the defensive mechanisms of all those around me to suddenly be disengaged. He stared at me at a moment and then hand on hip said, really, Mom? I wish that they were my real superpower, and in a way, I think I'm on the path. I am a kind of manatee of human beings. I don't really get defensive. I tell people, if you're trying to offend me, please bluntly tell me, because I will probably miss it. A close friend asked me to deeply, deeply reflect why that is. I think the key is this. I care about the us more than the me, and I'm almost obsessively curious. Maybe I wasn't always like that. Maybe it's from hanging out in youth-centered spaces all these years. I remember in one tense conference, planning meeting where there was something on the agenda that got people's feelings stirred up. A youth leader asked another youth leader something that be, could be construed as a slight. I started to feel defensive on behalf of the apparently insulted youth. And before I could step in as an adult holding the space, the youth struck three fingers out from their face and looked at the leader running the meeting. The procedural leader acknowledged this youth with, three, with the three fingers fanning out from her cheek, who then asked a series of questions back to the other youth. They weren't terse or tense, they were clarifying. The intensity of the moment evaporated. What is the magic? Turns out that the three fingers were the whiskers of clarity question of a curious cat, or, or shorthand for may I meet the intensity of this moment with curiosity instead of defensiveness. I find youth spaces full of these shorthand ways to bring people back to covenant. And when I'm out in the rest of the world and have those moments of defensiveness, because I am human, I need extra inspiration to be my better self. I think of the curious cat and turn to curiosity. You know, at this time of season, we get a lot of letters and requests for all kinds of donations to all kinds of wonderful charities and wonderful organizations that need money. And we kind of have to look at this and say, well, we can't give to everybody because for surely we'd be broke. And so we kind of pick out the ones that are really important to us and might donate to them. And so this time I'm thinking this church, this, this family, this home, this is where we need to to give, to make sure that this church stays where it is and that it opens up to all of us who need to come and find support and love and acceptance. So I'll ask you now the um, people come up for the plate. <laughs>
As I was heading to California to begin my ministerial internship, bittersweetly leaving the Unitarian Universalist Church of St. Petersburg, where I had been music director for the previous five years, I received some sage wisdom from the Reverend Jack Donovan, the, the minister during most of my time there in St. Petersburg. Jack had been unbelievably instrumental in my call to ministry. Some of you have probably heard of me speak glowingly about him before. He was the first person, really honestly, that, that I saw that I was like, oh my goodness, that, that right there, that's ministry. I want to do that. Uh, a model minister, an exemplar, and my friend. Everything about him felt warm, genuine, inspiring, grounded, thoughtful, caring, and perhaps most of all, gently curious. That may have been the characteristic that made each of the others really shine. And it didn't hurt that my daughters, Noah and Charlie, adored him. They, they really just looked forward to spending some time with him each Sunday morning for his stories or his time for all ages, which were always warm and inviting. He, he asked kids great open questions and then listened to their answers, deeply listened to them. He was genuinely curious about their lives and perspectives. So when I was leaving, when Jenea and I were getting on the road to go to the other side of the country, Reverend Jack sent me an email, a kind of parting gift, a, a fare thee well, that ended with this thought. Quote, their struggle and different mindsets that bamboozle even the best communication but always do the pastoral thing of asking the one magic question another and another and another time. That is, could you explain a little more what you mean by that? Clarity and patience cause many problems to resolve on their own." End quote. Now, I'm still working on embodying this advice. More often than not, I remember it well after it would have been helpful. But when I manage to heat it, and heat it well, conflicts indeed tend to work out okay. When embracing this kind of curiosity, when I turn to wonder, instead of getting more defensive, struggle, confrontation, conflicts somehow don't even become conflicts. They transform into deeper understanding of self, of each other, of the situation, and ultimately, Almost a, a miracle of relationship emerges, a, a process which to me is full of wonder. How this warm, gentle, curious process can transform so many potentially hairy situations into something that is more whole and holy and loving. Among other pastoral prophets, Parker Palmer suggests a similar idea in his Touchstones for Co-Creating Trustworthy Space. Uh, we've adapted these Touchstones uh, as almost a covenant for our Soul Circles program, so some of you may have heard this quote before in that context. Palmer says, quote, if you feel judgmental or defensive, ask yourself, I wonder what brought this person to this belief? I wonder what they're feeling right now. I wonder what my reaction teaches me about myself. Set aside judgment to listen to others and to yourself more deeply." End quote. I wonder what my reaction teaches me about myself. And so in this description, the curiosity that could you explain a little more what you mean is, is both an external process that you can literally ask somebody and and yet it is, is a turn to wonder within yourself, too. Wondering, what is it? What is it inside me right now that I, is moving me toward this defensive posture? A few months back, while celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day here, we read some poetry by Joy Harjo, and she expressively referred to this, this kind of defensive posture as a, as, a, as a panther getting ready to pounce. And it's interesting that what might actually prevent the pouncing from this panther, excuse the alliteration, is curiosity, which cats are known for pejoratively. 
Yet, as my dear friend and another mentor of mine, Reverend Tandy Rogers, said in the reading that Chris shared earlier, a cat's curiosity is indeed a powerful place of liberating love. Once again, sorry, not sorry for the alliteration. So as I move, as I move into any situation that the conflict is, is brewing, it's percolating, coming to the surface, when there's something defensive happening in my soul and I'm, I'm about ready to pounce, I desire to gently switch to that curious side of my cat nature. And I am a UU, so there's a cat nature in there. And my defensiveness dissipates. It kind of just floats away, turns into steam and relieves some pressure on my shoulders. I get to know myself and others better, too. Relationships become something new, something greater than the sum of its parts, and we've moved toward beloved community. Last winter, I attended a triannual seminar for continuing ministerial formation called the Institute for the Learning Ministry. Now, even though I was supposed to go and be there in person in San Diego, it was it was scheduled for basically the exact same time that Omicron really emerged, so it didn't work out, but um, I did attend this really transformative seminar virtually. And there were several courses I could attend as part of the event, yet the specific course I chose was called Collaborative Leadership, an area that I did and continue to desire to develop in myself. Interestingly, much of the conversation was about this, this, this notion of turning to wonder. And one of the one of the things that they that they said that really stuck for me that I, I wrote down in a big font on my notes and highlighted with yellow uh, was ask often what is coming up for me. So again, it's a it's a kind of could you explain a little more what you mean type question similar to when Palmer says I wonder what my reaction teaches me about myself. In this question. I'm gently and compassionately considering, hey, Nick, what's going on here? And I try to turn my affirming attention toward this developing defensive posture. A lot of Buddhist practitioners and meditation teachers and gurus, however you want to label that, that person who helps guide you through spiritual practice, a lot of them may advise you that when you can name the feeling or, or connect more deeply with with what's really happening inside of you that you gain a kind of power over it. In the psychology world, and Chris, you can tell me if this is right later or not, they might refer to this as self-actualization or self-differentiation, where you can kind of uh, objectify what you're experiencing while simultaneously validating what is coming up. Is that pretty close? Thank you. <laughs> to be self-differentiated does not mean that what your feeling isn't important and part of the whole you, and, and yet we still have the agency and authority over those emotions, over ourselves. When you can gently ask yourself, what is coming up for me? You can start where you are, as Pima Shudran might say, and begin a, a, again along a path of wonder. This, this relational path of, of self-discovery, self-actualization, self-differentiation, self-love. And it's, it's liberating. And it will also cool you off in moments of anger or defensiveness. It's, it's amazing when you can say, I'm angry, when you name it and validate it. That, that potentially destructive emotion, when you pay attention to it, notice it, you immediately smooth the edges of that anger. Take, take some of the heat out of it. The facilitators of the collaborative leadership course at the Institute last year leaned into this, this, this topic of becoming curious when defensive and perhaps reactive. They claimed, I believe rightly, that it's the empathetic thing to do, the compassionate course of action. When you practice being with the feelings and feeling alongside what is happening in yourself and others, you're, you're going deeper than, than the conflict that's merely on the surface. Asking what is happening? What, what story am I telling myself about what is happening? And those stories themselves are powerful things, sometimes destructive things. 
and we don't want to gaslight ourselves. That story is still valid. Yet if we can objectify them and name them as a story, we have a little bit more ability to adjust the story, disrupt it, subvert it for good. Hegemonies can live inside us, too. Once again, this is all about interpersonal, interdependent relationship. It's all about compassion and empathy and validating what we're feeling and then being able to go deeper with yourself and others. So this, this whole process of, of turning to wonder isn't, isn't merely about conflict, although that's a big part of it. It's also very much a pastoral process. Though pastoral care is a huge part of my job, a part that I rather enjoy, as part of this community, we all, we all are asked to be pastoral from time to time. We all, we all can offer each other pastoral presence. One of the other things that Parker Palmer suggests in his touchstones is to ask honest and open questions. This is very similar to that curious bit, isn't it? These are questions that truly center the person to whom you are listening, not yourself. And regardless of the situation, these questions are an invitation, not a demand. We want to avoid what we call sometimes spiritual tourism, which still centers yourself and not the person who needs the care. These invitations tend to be the how, when, where, and what questions. They're, they're questions that open the inquiry, not, not shut down the conversation, but don't open it up. And the, the question should be intended to help the other person explore their issue or concern rather than satisfying your own curiosity. And that's an interesting, troubling bit of today's topic, right? It can't always be about satisfying your own curiosity, especially when there's, there's a, a power imbalance at play. Then, then you're potentially just kind of digging up somebody else's trauma without care for how the stuff under the surface may reemerge and make the problem worse. You're not furthering the relationship. And that's, I believe, what is really the most interesting, compelling thing to keep in mind here, that, that turning to wonder and curiosity isn't just about stopping the discomfort or conflict. It's a shift that opens us up further and further to love and compassion and empathy and relationship. We are Unitarian Universalists in search of beloved community actively trying to create beloved community, the heart of our mission here, the heart, I believe, of Unitarian Universalism. And when things get rough, which they will, we are humans and life happens, yet when things get difficult, may we turn and return to wonder. A legitimate awe of the other person, an awe of ourselves, an awe of the shared story that's developing in real time knowing that the other person's life and their story is powerful and in many ways, a miracle. It's a miracle that you and I, all of you and I, are in this infinitesimally small moment of time and space together here this morning, having an opportunity to be with one another and have an opportunity to become with one another. Why not treat that as a miracle it is? approach our lives with the wonder of a child so that we may open up ourselves to something bigger. Opening to knowing more about each other and ourselves and, and grounding ourselves in this affirming, compassionate curiosity. May that wonderful worldview move us toward mutual transformation and move us toward love. Blessed be. Please rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, The Star of Truth. And again, I will play this all the way through. Star of truth, but 
dimly shines behind the veiling clouds of night. But every searching eye divine some partial glimmer of its light. The certainty for which we crave no mortal ones can ever know. Uncharted waters we must brave and face whatever winds may blow. Though for safe harbor we may long, we must not let our courage fail. And though the winds of doubt blow strong upon the trackless ocean sail, from honest doubt we shall not flee. Nor fetter the inquiring mind, for where the hearts of all are free, a truer faith we there shall find. You can remain standing if you'd like in body or spirit. It will be a short benediction. As Reverend Tandy Rogers said earlier, as we go out into the rest of the world and we have these moments of defensiveness because we are indeed human, may we be inspired to think of the curious cat and turn to curiosity, turn to wonder. gentlemen, I haven't performed in a while, so this is the first time. Uh, bear with me. I'm going to wish you a Merry Christmas. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. Next year, all our troubles will be out of sight. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. Next year, all our
Christmas movie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.